I know, well, welcome everybody um, to what I think should be a really interesting evening. Um, I was told that this is about raising the roof on Leicester's literary talent. And I think that each of the, the speakers tonight have been asked to think about how can we raise the profile of Leicester's rich and diverse talent of writers. Um, so I think you know, that, that in itself is a, a very interesting topic. Um, have all of you received a copy of who is speaking tonight, or would it help if we'd known? So um, let me introduce the panel. Um, we've made a slight change to the programme in the fact that we're going to have the four, four speakers and then we'll have a moment for question and answer, by which time Councillor Sarah Russell, she's not here already, will join us. Um, and then there will be um, further um, uh, speakers in Henderson, Mullen and James Urquhart, so that will be um, towards the end. And we are finishing at 9.30 on the dot. So I might have to be slightly fierce as a chair, um, but there are a number of people who have to catch trains. So um, without further ado, I would like to start over here um, and introduce you to Matthew Pegg, who's Director of Mantle Arts and Mantle Lane Press, um, to Fahana Sheikh, who is uh, a, a writer and part of Daily Publish. Yeah. Um, Bob Cass needs no introduction probably to most of you in the room, but a um, prolific writer and wonderful all-round person. Um, and uh, Emily, who is president of the Leicester Writers Club. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Bob Cass, who is going to lead the first provocation conversation. I want to give you a poem, warm slice from my heart the way no one was a stranger to butter melting on a crust of my grandmother's homemade bread. I grew up in a household in Seattle. Uh, my mother came from what we would call here a working class family. My father was English and came from a, a, a petty bourgeois family. Uh, and I didn't understand any of that until I came to England. Then I understood what the social class issues were really. But on the way to England, I came via Africa. I, I lived in Nigeria for four years. Uh, and what, uh, what I you know, want to say about that home is, I, you know, the household I grew up in as a child, uh, there was this, these sort of rhymes and poems around me all the time. And that was part of my mother's working class background. My grandmother, who lived with us, uh, and, and there would be these little poems that they would say from time to time. M mother, uh, we had a nook where we sat and, and uh, ate and looked out onto a little bit of what we call a yard, uh, the backyard. Uh, and, and one day on this nook, there was a cord that you pulled uh, for the uh, light to go on in that little nook, appeared this little quotation mother had found from the newspaper. <laughs> in matters of something, controversy or something, my perception is rather fine. I always see both points of view, the one that's wrong and mine. <laughs> so, you know, poetry was like, I had poetry at school, it would be something from, um, uh, good heavens, I'm, I'm trying my age because I'm all, all, almost getting there. Carl Sandberg, I'm almost getting, I'm almost dating. Uh, Carl Sandberg. Uh, or Robert Frost, something like that. And they'd be small poems, and I would learn these by heart. I love them by heart. And so that was the background I came from. Uh, and that poem, I think, uh, you know, tells you a lot about what was important to me as a child and, and the my habitus, if you want board you, you know, you, the, the environment I grew up in. Uh, and I tried poetry, I did a lot of, I did a, tried, I was always trying poems and so forth, and I, when I went on to university I was trying poems, but they were all very tight and very, oh, intense, until I came out as a gay, began coming out as a gay man in the uh, early 80s. Uh, and, and in the course of that, uh, of really coming out, and the, uh, by 1993 I had uh, the, the poetry flowed and I heard the poetry and so forth. 
Uh, and then uh, novels, the novels came out of uh, all, the, that kind of thing. So that's, that's where the poetic energy has come from. And it's so important, you were talking about, it's so important that we honor these moments in people's lives. And I'm looking around this room and I'm seeing beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people who help honor these moments in people's lives here in Leicester. And Leicester to me is just like, I love Leicester. And it's because of this range of this di these diversity. And that poem actually came, I was, I'm sorry Carol Leeming isn't here tonight because Carol's very important to my life. I, I was across at Carol Leeming's uh, uh, one evening having a conversation about the the years I'd spent in Nigeria, and we were talking about all and hospitality. And we, we, we were just talking about that as important and, and saying, you know, no one ever came in that back door of that house in Ballard in Seattle without my grandmother offering them something she'd baked or something like that. You know, that was that was hospitality. And on the way home, walking back to my house from Carol, I will say, what those of you who are poets here know, I heard the poem. I, I've had to learn to write down when I hear something. I've had to learn to write it down immediately. Okay, beautiful, beautiful people. Now, ping. Everybody has something that goes ping. That's the strap line. It's about, uh, you know, being, thinking about uh, how, you know, trying to get through this gender stuff around sexuality and what have you. I won't tell a long story of how, how we, I got that title, but it came from my granddaughter. Uh, and uh, one of my granddaughters. Now I can say I can say one of my granddaughters. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, at, at, at any rate, Ping uh, Ping didn't get going. It's it's in its seventh year now until uh, 2011. But uh, that came out of uh, the following things. I want to give some acknowledgments. And some of you, some of the people are here. And if I don't refer to you looking at you, I'll remember. <laughs> to say. Okay, first of all, someone got me to Word. Carol told me about Word. You know, Word's the longest, uh, the, the longest, well, it's the longest in England, really, but we won't argue that because they're so afraid to say that because of someone from somewhere else. But, you know, this is a spoken word event that is, is so beautiful and so gorgeous in our lives. Someone got me to, and you know why I went to that first Word? Because Word was doing something with Amnesty International. Now that tells us about what we can capitalize. Ooh, what a dreadful word! What we can what we can access here in Leicester. I mean, when you all I think of when I hear the word capitalism these days is Donald Trump, and I mean that just completely does me. Okay, so all I, all I can uh, you know you know to access uh, what uh, we can access. It was Amnesty International. It was an event with Amnesty, and I went to that word event. And that was it. And people were welcoming, and I said a bit of my poetry and whatever. <laughs> you know, this was like this was like someone uh, this was like someone coming down the street in the road I lived on as a kid. It was just so beautifully welcoming. And of course Lydia's here, and Lydia and Tim, and of course Lydia and Tim. And as soon as you think Lydia and Tim, you also think the mental health sector in Leicester. This is another brilliant area where Lester is just drawing people in. You come to ping events now, and there will be people at the, those events who are right in the middle of working through mental health issues and poetry. Poetry is part of that. Well, we got going in 2011, and following that, why we got there? Well, I wanted a small event where people who were working on who they were could speak out who they were sexually, could speak out. And uh, I used to say, I'm, I used to introduce myself, I'm Bubba Gass, I'm a gay, gray, gray poet. Uh, and no one was doing that in those days. You know, it's how, things have changed a lot. We've got a recognition for some gay poets recently, but no one was doing it uh, in, uh, in 2006 even. There wasn't much of that stuff around. Uh, and, but I wanted a, a kind of a smaller venue where people could, wouldn't be so afraid, because a word can be big, and that can be daunting for some. 
where, where people, and, and, and that's, that's what happened, that's how it got going. Uh, then some beautiful stuff happened. Carol linked me up with uh, Michaela. We had some big events, umbrella kind of events, at, uh, at, at Attenborough Arts, or whatever it was being called at that point. Embrace Arts, probably, at that point. Uh, Corin Fowler was crucial. You see, I'm talking, and I'm talking about something that's very close to me, and Emma's going to follow me, which is beautiful. Because Leicester is a place of women's energy. I have found again and again and again, when I was facing institutions that were not receptive, somewhere in that hierarchy was a woman who was looking at how she could subvert them and get things, keep things moving. Now, I'm not, I don't want to be too categoric about that. That would sound far too, uh, far too American. But, uh, you know, I don't want to be too, but, but by and large, women's energy is crucial, and this is something we want to look at and acknowledge. Uh, okay, so, uh, and, and we, we had some beautiful events. Beautiful, and we had a, par a parade. I'm telling you, if you want to hear it and know it, I will tell you this parade pro proposal, because I was very interested. Coventry's going to pip us to the post now, because it's got City of Culture, and it's going to have that medieval style parade with carts and that is part of what is going to, we could have done that in Leicester but we couldn't get the funding and what have you and, and the thing fell through for the city of culture and all of that all, all of that bit of the story but that 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 you know and, and here again is something you know we can get up to some mischief with our colleague when we work together and find we can get up to some real mischief and it's so it brings us together, doesn't it? To think that we've got round some of these stumbling blocks uh, and achieved that. Okay, well, Magnus isn't here. He's in, he's in, he's in Nottingham with his daughter now. But Magnus is, is in Reykjavik now. But Magnus, uh, at the ping events, he would open the gallery. The gallery gets her for a month. That little gallery that he was going around the city with. And there's another real important clue how we link up with the other arts, never thinking that the literary is something that's isolated to the, like, the, the page and, and, well, the page. No, we must keep constantly be linking with the other arts, and Magnus was part of that. Uh, Alison Dunn, she was with the libraries then. I, I won't go into why she isn't with the libraries now, but at any rate, Alison Dunn was crucial. She was doing beautiful things. She's one of these women in a, in an inst within an institution that was, you know, making the curtains shiver. That's a very exciting image. I can get, could get behind the arras at any point and do something. Okay, Keith Allott at uh, uh, Link, well he's now at the Phoenix, but I mean he was doing, uh, he was in, in a venture where there was a lot of video uh, work and that kind of thing, which was then still, you know, in its infancy. And he was linking with uh, Word and opening things out. And then we, we, we established the People's Arts Collective. Uh, and, and that was too beautiful. And still is still going on, and people uh, initiating in, in various unpredictable ways. Wonderful event at Yezin Cafe. It's no longer going now, but that was a Sunday evening, and people came along of all, all across the, the uh, I don't want to limit to art spectrum, but across the arts, we'll call it the art spectrum. Uh, and, then, and then I uh, started up a, a choral poetry event. Now, what was interesting about choral poetry? is Jean Binter Breeze clued us in. Remember, Jean is a mentor, an incredible mentor for many of us here in Leicester. Uh, Jean clued us in. If you were in Jamaica, choral poetry would be big time in schools and that kind of thing. Not necessarily uh, that we've got that here. But we tried to get this going. I, I, I couldn't keep it, uh, keep it going, but it's something that was a spin-off. Uh, okay, and, and I've mentioned, these are people who involved in Ping, but they, in some way, some of them moved out, like Liz Gray. Liz moved out from uh, Ping and what she was doing. Marcus Joseph, I, I, I said hello to Marcus Joseph when he first came uh, back to Leicester. He's a Leicester lad, uh, and he came to Word, and I said, what are you doing? He was just trying to find his feet. 
Well, Marcus Joseph, just imagine now, when you think, here's some of these names, you just think, what they're doing now is just incredible. Um, VJ Mystery, of course, I was working with, he was bringing a lot from Too Funky and everything like that. Rob, Rob G, well, I'm glad someone's here from Mantle Press, because I brought along a couple of Rob G's. Uh, Rob G, you didn't, here, here you are, you can hold those for now, because Mantle Press got Rob G to do these wonderful things at Moira and Castle Donington, and they are fantastic. If you are a Leicester, Leicestershire person, as my uh, ex-partner is, whom I still live with, uh, and she read these, she, I could just see straight away, she was linking up with what the spirit of something that Rob had touched in her. Yes, you can you can hold them for for now because that's that's metal press. I want you know I want you to know this is something this is this is what we're engaged with. We're just so alive, it's around us. Uh, Louise Catarega, who's a dancer, and look what Louise is is uh, is bringing in. Mello, who's here tonight, uh, and, and, and in in just so many different ways. Mello sings Ping out every. She'll be singing Ping out at the end of this month on the twenty seventh at. The, uh, at the Criterion. Um, Peter Buckley. Peter, uh, I don't know how many of you know Peter, but Peter's doing the illustrations for something I'm going to read from in a minute. Richard Burt, Keishan Annan, and Dave Donald, who work together, and there, there's, a, there's a, a, really it's far out, you've got to go to an anarchy, anarchy, or A-N-E-R-K-I, uh, it, it, it's at the font at the moment. It's usually the last Friday of the month or something like that. But you need to get linked into that. Go to at least once of those, one of those because there, this is this is the art off the wall. Uh, and of course, Indian Summer. We're linked in uh, with Indian Summer now. Uh, how am I doing for time? You've just got a couple of minutes. Oh, that's dreadful. Uh, okay, <laughs> I've got to. Um, <coughs> so, this is something I did with uh, supported at uh, Word with called uh, More Perverse, Poetry for Change. Uh, this is the ping coming into this, uh, coming uh, up to the end of June. And on this you will see Ishi Jack Con Jackson, who's doing something in poetry, uh, poetry whatever. Uh, and, but she's got cultural exchanges to support her for a workshop and a feature at ping. You know, we're talking about networking. We're talking about these gorgeous, gorgeous links. Now, you're not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna have time to read to you, but uh, two more things. I've got some for sale if you want them. It's a limited edition, uh, but this tells, this was a, after five years of ping, this tells the story of ping. And I wanna read something from this, and then I'm gonna have to leave it there. Uh, I wanna read something from this about in transition. Once again, three pings in the year welcomed in in translation material with trans of body, place, and language. This is the second year these sessions took place and pings throughout the year had poetry in other languages interspersed with English. Poetry in other languages. So here's another big important area for Lester. Assamese, Esperanto, Farsi, French, German, Gujarati, Icelandic, Italian, Jamaican Patois, Portuguese, Mandarin, and Spanish. Okay? We're just a little group, and all of that's there. That was there. Metrosexual poets felt especially welcomed by these sessions. December's Pink had a breakthrough in international involvement and attendance with a tabla and sitar improvisation. And this was volunteered and a later jam event with 50 attending and Leicester diverse city at its best heralds an exciting thing future. My very, my last couple of words, I'm sorry, uh, I, I haven't run, uh, left enough energy to read you Trouble at the Zoo, which is one of the, I, I'm writing fables for my grandchildren at the moment. And the basis for the, the or the link with the fables is it's, there's a creatives cult, uh, create creatures creatives collective. Ambrose is one of the people. Ambrose, of course, has been supporting throughout all of this. Uh, and, and they've come together, and I'm, I'm insisting in the publication of this that it comes from Leicester. 
You know, we've got all of the energy. Okay, maybe the price is going to have to be a little bit more on these fables that are printed one by one, but it's going to come from Leicester. We've got the links and the energy here. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Emma, yes. <laughs> well, I'm a poet, so I should be very quick. <laughs> you know, our art is based on saying as much as possible in as few words as possible. Um, I'm here with my President Leicester Writers Club hat on, it's one of many I wear, and as a club we meet every week on a Thursday at Phoenix Square, right in the heart of Leicester's cultural quarter. Our core business is giving members feedback on work in progress and also marketing tips, how to, publish, how to approach publishers and also how to market our work because as writers we are being asked much more to do our own marketing. Gone are the days where you could have a nice long lunch with a publisher who would give you a long list of things that they would do. It's all down to us now to go out there and speak, although the poets have had to do this for a very long time because there's never any money in poetry. As well as this, we also run advanced master classes. We have talks from industry speakers such as literary agents and publishers. We run social events and a writer's retreat. We do a lot. Our members are novelists, poets, short story writers, script writers, and spoken word artists. We cover all the writing. You know, we, we don't exclude. And our members have been widely published in the UK, throughout Europe, in both North and South America, Africa, and New Zealand. And we've had writers shortlisted for the Carnegie Awards, the Philip K. Dick Awards, and also prize winners in poetry and short story competitions. As worthy of a mention here, we had a prize winner in Writing East Midlands Aurora competition that was run last year, and also a prize winner in the Leicester Wright Short Story Prize, which Fahana's going to talk a bit more about in a bit. So we do support locally, and some of our members have also been judges for short story and poetry writing competitions as well. But Leicester Writers Club are not insular. We don't sit around Phoenix Square talking to each other. We do reach out, we do support other literary initiatives within Leicester. We've held events for the Leicester Writes Festival. We've supported everybody's reading and done events for that. We've also done other events in partnership with other organisations. And we invariably <coughs> have a stall at States of Independence. That's what we do as a club, but our individual members also go out and support and perform at other events. We've had writers perform at Word, at Shindy, at Novel Exchanges, at Anarchy. In fact, most spoken word nights in Leicester have featured a Leicester Writers Club member at some point. We're out there. Um, we've also done things like the Jonas Festival and Refugee Week programs. Uh, I've stood on Town Hall Square to do a reading as part of Refugee Week. For instance, we've also done the readings at cultural exchanges to Norfolk University's festival. Some of our writers have also taught the Writing School East Midlands and run workshops. We are out there supporting other writers. And in fact, two of our members have set up a writer's development agency, the Writing Shed. And a couple of our members also lecture at the Norfolk University in creative writing. And in addition, two club members have supported the Leicester Writer Showcase, who have organised this event tonight, from its inception. And indeed, all 12 events the Leicester Writer Showcase have held so far have involved at least one member of the Leicester Writers Club in some form or other. Even the ensemble events that have been there to promote anthologies, we've had a member there. And in addition, I personally, I was involved in co-editing Welcome to Leicester, a poetry anthology to celebrate the city of Leicester. And my wonderful assistant here is holding up the posters we did for Journeys in Translation, where we took some of the poems from the Overland Sea anthology and translated them into a wealth of other languages. And we're up to 22 at the moment. Everything from Arabic to Welsh, I think, at the moment. <laughs> Um, indeed, I've been involved in some of the translations as well. So I feel, Leicester Writers Club, we have some absolutely fantastic talent in Leicester. The club itself is very supportive of other initiatives going on. 
but we kind of feel a bit invisible. We don't feel that people in the city really know who we are or what we do, or the fact that there is all this talent here in Leicester. And I'm not quite sure how we could reach out and do that. And perhaps some discussion here tonight will bring that out. <laughs> Thank We are definitely a people of exceptional talent, big hearts, but incredible humility. Um, and I think a lot of my work, what I try to do is kind of create safe spaces for people who may otherwise feel like they're not representative in other places in the city and county, but also try to harness a community of creativity where you know, everyone can kind of have a go and just join in. So um, to begin with, I'm just going to say a bit more about Dali Publishing and why I set it up. Um, Dali Publishing is a Leicester-based small press publisher. We primarily work with regional and diverse voices and we're keen to work with local authors to help develop their writing talent and provide opportunities for publication so, um, last year, we, well, it's been such a long year, I was just making sure that it was last year. Um, we worked with Emma and Ambrose to publish Welcome to Leicester, which I don't know if that was there yet. Um, and we also commissioned local writers and had an open call to publish short stories. And there's 20 in there featuring so it kind of gives people an opportunity to get published alongside more established names. So um, there's people like Jonathan Taylor in this and Alison Moore, people that we should kind of celebrate a lot more. Um, and that's one of my provocations, actually, because um, I think that once we step out of our own literature circles, we might be surprised to hear how few people actually know the writers that live and work in the city and it is actually quite shocking. Um, I think two weeks ago I happened to do a NatWest business talk or event and no one knew any of the writers I mentioned at all and it was quite horrifying but also very eye-opening and hopefully will give me enough food for thought to do something about it. Because that's what I'm like. So, um, we engage with writers in, actually, just as a show of hands, how many people in the room are actually writers? I know most people, some people are new to me. Okay, so most of us. Okay, so, on the first Tuesday of every month, we host the writers' meetups. I think many people actually come to those um, at Brew Coffee. And I think it's just kind of like an informal space where people can come together and just get some moral support as well as inspiration um, and share sort of news because I think that always keeps people motivated to write um, and share ideas. And again, it's a safe space for writers to network, um, get advice and support. The, meeting, the meetups have been running since May 2013, um, but it started off quite small and now we sort of average between 15 to 20 people that come, not every month, we see quite a good turnover of new faces, um, but we always have quite strong numbers. Um, and I think it kind of shows that Leicester is definitely not only an exciting place I think maybe sometimes it's because it's not that exciting that creativity culture kind of thrives in the city. Um, maybe it's just boredom, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Something to do. Um, we also run a quarterly literary night, Novel Exchanges, which happens at The Exchange, which provides novelists with the opportunity to 
try out a piece of work in development, but again, doing that alongside an established <coughs> published author. Um, and it's, again, it just feels like <coughs> a Duncan do um, read from his novel yesterday. And yes, there were only five people that broke the snow to be there, but it just felt incredibly special. And I think that kind of speaks volumes about Leicester as a space. You know, it's a really nurturing environment and it feels like we could do so much more than we're actually doing. And sometimes I think we achieve a lot more than in spite of structures or institutions or like lack of funding, we actually do more um, just because we have like heroes like Lydia and Bubba. You know, people really spearheading things in the city. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do at Dahlia, yes, we have, we do kind of create these spaces and kind of just keep encouraging through constant contact with writers to keep going and work on their writing. But we also provide opportunities. So we've done a brew poet in residence. So we had a Leicester Writers Club member who won that commission, um, Jane Stanton. Um, and she spent three sessions in the brew coffee shop um, and created five new poems. So kind of cool stuff to disrupt models or, you know, kind of hope to encourage people that might not necessarily try, you know, like not stuffy in any way or saying that you have to, you know, do something, I don't know, historical or whatever. Um, so we try and break down barriers to encourage people that you don't always see at literature events to kind of get involved. And I think that's really important because I never ever came across a writer growing up um, and being part of a kind of growing up in a working class um, environment, it can feel like actually it's a whole world away. So I think it's important that we, all of us, kind of look to see how we can break down those barriers and make it easier for people who might not necessarily um, have access or opportunity. Um, so, one of the things we did this year is we launched the Leicester Wright's Short Story Prize. Now, this was a nationwide competition to celebrate the best short story writing, but we offered a concession to local writers. Um, this is the collection that was produced and it contains 20 of the long list, um, 20 of the long listed writers um, and we launched in Leicester and I think that's kind of a way that we can kind of up our game because we're being taken seriously on a national level we had 50% um, of, we had 102 entries 50% of which were from within Leicestershire and the way we encouraged local writers to get involved is that we had a concession so Leicester, right, Leicester share writers um, could enter for just three pound, and again, that kind of makes it easier for people. Um, we received support, right, from BBC Radio Leicester, as well as the Bristol Short Story Prize to actually set the competition up in the first place. Sorry, I'm just reading my notes. Going, what does that say? <laughs> and this goodwill and gen generosity enabled us to kind of reach out in a way that we wouldn't, and also take ourselves a bit more seriously. Because I think um, it's fine to kind of, and I'm always guilty of doing this. Like, I think we can get too comfortable. And I'm kind of one of those people that once I get too comfortable, I'm like, what else can I do? <laughs> so I think that's important. Um, but I think that what that taught me was that actually, yes, um, there's an incredible, not that we didn't know that there was talent in the city, but also that it can be paired against the national picture. Actually, Siobhan, you sing at the back. Come on, Siobhan, wave. Yes, embarrass her. Yeah, she actually became a second prize winner, Leicester Writers Club member. Yeah, we're seeing a trend here, aren't we, for the Leicester Writers Club? Um, and I think it just gives people a kind of acknowledgement that their writing is just as good 
as anybody else. I think that's really important. Um, the first prize winner was Cambridge author, um, short story writer and novelist C.G. Menon, um, who's pretty much won every short story prize going. So, um, you know, and it was a really <coughs> difficult decision between the first, second, and third. You know, it was really hard. I think Debbie is here. I think she, oh yeah, one of my judges. I won Kipworth Bookshop. Um, and she will agree that it was actually really, really difficult in time. Um, and it just kind of, it, I think doing those kind of things helps us to see how we're doing in the city and county, but also to say we've got the talent here as well. You know, we don't need to constantly be overlooked for other places that, you know, it's a great place. Um, hang on, how am I doing time? We also, oh yeah, yeah. okay, just moving on. Um, so Dali Publishing also runs the Leicester Writers Festival of New Writing annually in June. Um, and we kind of see this as a way of celebrating regional talent. Um, but also inviting people, so C.G. Menon came in and did a short story workshop which was free and again that's kind of improving or developing the skills of local writers and it's an opportunity for people to get involved um, and again just get better at what they're doing. And that festival is now going to be moving into its fourth year it's a mix of workshops and you could, we also did like meet the publisher events so again I think like for me personally the idea of going to London to do a kind of meet the publisher or a pitch event pitch your novel event which I actually did at the London Book Fair this year which is terrifying by the way um, doing that in Leicester or bringing some of those ideas in Leicester helps us to <coughs> It's a stepping stone to publication, and it makes it easier. And that's what I think we should do more of as well. Look at how we can invite bigger organisations that are maybe kind of... I mean, I, w I just did the Asian Writer Festival in London, and actually what I found was a lot of organisations said, we're too London-centric, and we need to get out. So I think now's the time to kind of... Um, I don't know what the word is, God. Am I right? I've lost my word. Lydia, can you figure it out? Seize the moment. Yes, seize the moment. There you go. Um, because we are kind of a warm and welcoming place, and we can do so much more if we just maybe um, be a little bit more ambitious. Um, and then I've written here, and I have no idea why I wrote this. Um, a strong focus on inclusivity and a bad badass attitude that anyone can have a go and be part of. Then, and finally our publishing programme, a um, couple of the books mentioned, but also we do, we just publish UK writers with a focus on championing regional and diverse voices and I think being in Leicester and being a Leicester based publisher doing those things kind of, um, it just again sort of means that we're not overlooked constantly or you know are you all right there <laughs> what was that because i'm on the ceiling because okay. um, it's a shame i think to feel invisible and to feel that what we're doing is somehow not reaching people so everyone written their contact details i'm gonna take a photo of that email everyone. Um, yeah. Um, how many people are on Twitter by the way? Really? Yeah. So if you follow us at Leicester Writes that might again be a way because I think social media is a great way to break down these barriers um, and to tap in to what other people are doing. And very, that my final closing point would be that we've just launched um, a Leicester Writes shared <coughs> calendar um, and that will give everyone an opportunity if they want to come and see me later or any organisers it just kind of puts all the literature stuff in one place um, and it means that A, we don't clash on events even though that's okay you know, London clashes everything all the time 
and it's fine. Um, but it also will mean that we don't forget or didn't see that thing. Because I think sometimes it's like, oh wow, if only I had known about that event, I would have gone. Now there's no excuses, because everything's in one place. And that's it. three people thinking, oh my god, I've got to talk. Um, anyway, right, um, Mantle Arts, I'm, I just thought I'd explain a little bit about what we're doing at the moment and why it might be interesting for some of you. Um, we're based in Colville in Leicestershire, um, northwest Leicestershire. It was interesting what you were saying about feeling isolated in Leicester because uh, <laughs> Colville definitely sometimes feels as though you're in, on another planet really. So it's really interesting to be here because one of the things we're trying to do is to sort of get into contact with other organisations and, and do more in the city as well. Um, Mantle Arts has been around since 1985 and it's up until sort of two and a half, three years ago, it was a very broadly based participatory arts organisation. So we did processions, we did, uh, we programmed festivals for people, we did work in schools, we did work in um, community groups, libraries, all sorts of stuff. Um, and we were very diverse, we went out and worked in other places, so we did festivals in Maplethorpe and uh, worked for people in Worksworth and sort of went all, all over the place really in the East Midlands to do things. Um, which was great in some ways, and we'd do anything anybody sort of needed doing really, so we did, you know, if somebody wanted to put up a sculpture in the middle of their town, we could find an artist who could do that and we could run the project for them. But it started to feel as though we were being so diverse and so wide in what we did that, um, that we didn't really have a, a character as an organisation. So we thought we'll develop a specialisation. And I just finished um, in 2012 a creative writing MA at uh, Nottingham Trent, where uh, the late Graham Joyce was my tutor, which was a, um, a really, really good experience for me. I got an aw awful lot out of it. So creative writing was in the forefront of my uh, brain. Um, so we decided that we would reinvent ourselves as an organisation that was focused on creative writing and writing in, in lots of different areas. Um, and we got some funding from the Arts Council to do so and set up a project called Red Lighthouse. And Red Lighthouse is trying to do three different things. Um, one is writer support and development and um, um, helping people to develop their work. Um, we're still doing community projects, but we're now basing them on aspects of creative writing. Um, and we're also setting up a small press publisher. So I just thought I'd run through a few things in all three of those areas, which kind of overlap, actually. They're not that distinct, and they probably should never be anyway. Um, but in terms of writer development, we decided to focus on writing for children and young adults because it was a, a niche that we didn't feel that, um, well, we weren't treading on anybody else's toes massively, and it also was something that I was personally quite interested in and felt was important because I think the books that you read when you're a child are the ones that really, really affect you and stay with you through your life, and that seems to me to be a, a really important thing. So, um, we set up a conference called Wolves and Apples, which is a, a writing for children event. Um, we've done two of those in Leicester, um, and the third one is coming up in 2018. And we've had some really interesting guests. We've, um, we've had Tanya Landman, who won the Carnegie Prize a couple of years ago. And this was just a fantastic coincidence, because I didn't invite her because she was on the list for the Carnegie Prize. I just invited her because she was somebody I knew. She used to be in a theatre company that I've done some work with. Um, and after we invited her and she said, yes, I'll come, and then she'd negotiate her fee up a bit. Um, and then she won the Carnegie Prize, so I thought, yes, that's, uh, that's really good. So that's been an interesting event to run. Um, it's attracted mostly writers from the Midlands, but also some, we had somebody come down from Scotland to do it, and that's something we're hoping to build. Um, we did two annual versions of Bulls and Apples. Um, it's going to be October, no, 29th of September next year, if anybody's interested in that. Um, and we did two annually, and then we decided we ought to make it biannual and do other things in the off year. 
so we started doing some master classes because it came up, became obvious from the first few conferences there were some areas that really needed longer than an hour session or something like that to really get um, under the skin of. Um, so we started doing a series of master classes. Um, the next one is on the 17th of March, if anybody is interested in it, and it's um, with Celia Reese, who, uh, whose most famous book is probably Witch Child. Um, and even if you don't remember the title, you'd probably recognise the cover because it's got one of these really evocative covers that sticks in your mind. So she's doing a masterclass for us with Linda Newbury, and it's at the Ramada Encore, just around the corner. Um, and it's basically for people start just starting a children's book or a book for young adults. So it's a sort of how do you structure your work, how do you get going, um, how do you keep your ideas flowing, how do you see it through to the end and not get so bored with it that you <laughs> decide to stop. Um, so that's happening. Um, and we're also going to run starting next year a sort of training course for writers from any kind of discipline really who are interested in doing sort of participatory work so either being a, a writer in residence or working in schools or working in libraries or whatever it might be so people who haven't already established themselves for that in that area um, so that's sort of writer development stuff community projects we have uh, we're just doing a, a songwriting project in care homes uh, for people with dementia around Colville um, so that's interesting. Um, we've just done our first uh, one today, this morning actually, and um, trying to get people with dementia to sing along to Jolene is apparently quite difficult, but uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting project. And we're going to probably publish a CD at the end of that process, so we're going to record all the people's songs and uh, issue something in the end. Uh, we're doing a playwriting project in schools, which is a repeat of something we did two years ago, and that's working with Curve. So we're going into, I think, three city schools, including Ashfield Academy, um, and Moat, and uh, one Colville school. And they're writing plays with Rob G, um, who's going into work with schools. And then after Christmas, we're sending actors and a director in so they can see how their plays work when somebody's actually trying to put them on their feet, because sometimes they, uh, they come up with things which are actually quite difficult theatrically. But I think it's interesting for them to see how actors work on that. And then there will be a showcase at Curve in May where they will do all of them. And last time we did this, they did 32, 32 plays in an hour and um, 10 minutes. They're very short plays, but it was quite mad. Um, Zombie Grandmother was the standout <laughs> one. Um, so, and we're also starting a literary festival in Colville um, and currently looking for local writers who are interested in coming and write, writing doing workshops or uh, running an event or something. It's a, it's a sort of pilot for that, because Colville hasn't got a sort of very big literary sort of um, environment. It's not the right word, I think what I mean. Um, so we're just testing the ground, so trying out what might work and what might not. But if anybody is interested in that, then by all means um, talk to me after. Um, We've got Joanne Harris coming as the sort of main guest for that, who does a sort of storytelling with music event, which sounds quite interesting. So it's it's going to be that's going to be fun. And the last thing we've done is publishing. So we've started a small press, like you do when you're bored and you don't have anything to do. Um, and Mantle's always published things. Um, when I arrived, they they published this in the early 90s, which is an oral history of Leicestershire coalfields, um, which we recently put on Kindle, and because there's no electronic version of it, I went through the whole thing and scanned it, not particularly character recognised it, and then found out how many spelling mistakes there were in the original edition, so uh, there's a prize for anyone who can guess that. Um, so there's always been a history of publishing books for Mantle, and we sort of slid into it really. Yeah? Sorry, I thought you were whispering at me. No, God, no. I must be hearing things. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, we kind of slid into the into the being the small press thing. We uh, The first thing we did was this, by Katie Daniels, who's um, a writer we'd worked with on participatory projects, and she sort of mentioned that she'd got this collection in her bottom drawer, which uh, the Arts Council had paid for her to write, and then she'd never done anything about it, and it's got some um, sort of 
she, she told me not to publicise it on the basis that it was about the breakup of her marriage and um, no, I won't tell you all that, it's, it's a bit rude. But she, she went to a family wedding in Brazil in the middle of her um, marriage breakup and had this rather surreal sort of uh, experience of being in another country. And it, I just really liked it and we thought, yeah, let's publish it. So, you know, probably I should be telling you that we had this great, well-organised plan for how you start a small press, but actually it sort of crept up on us in um, interesting ways. So we did that one, and the format was basically stolen from the Penguin 60s, which I always liked as a little sort of sample book of things. So when we thought about that, we started to think, well, it's an interesting format for things that don't really fit into a... A, a main book and that mainstream publishers might not be interested in. So we started to talk to people who might have a novella sitting in their bottom drawer or who might have written a series of short stories or vignettes or things like that. And we started to promote this as a, a format for Midlands-based writers and possibly as a sort of first publication or an early publication opportunity. And we've now done four more. So Kaleidoscope by Solero Leavesley is um, a book about somebody going a bit mad really after the death of a child. Um, Mary Williams who writes as Valentine Williams, these are little vignettes of life in different countries that she's visited, short stories. Night Swimming, Gary Fletcher is um, a Birmingham based writer and these are all very sort of urban gritty vignettes of life in, in that city. Um, that was the, the second one we did, Emma Lanny, who is a Derby-based writer, who just writes beautiful um, sort of short pieces, um, and that's just probably still my favourite one. And uh, Catherine from uh, Creative Leicestershire put us on to Emma, so I'm grateful to her for that one. Um, so we started to publish those, and then we started to think about anthologies. So we've done two, um, What Holds the Heart, is a, story, a book about hauntings of all sorts. And what interested me wasn't producing a book of ghost stories, it was about producing a book of things focused around that idea. So some of these are ghost stories, but some of them are stories about people who are just haunted by things in their past. And I quite like the ambiguity of it, in that you don't quite know exactly what you're going to read when you pick this up and read one of those stories, and I thought that was interesting. Um, it doesn't make it any easier to market, but it's an interesting idea, I think. Um, there's, I think there's about two-thirds of the writers in here are Midlands-based, so East Midlands and West Midlands, and we've uh, worked with writing East Midlands and writing West Midlands to, to sort of contact people, and we're now trying to spread out the, the ways we find writers a little bit more. Um, the most recent anthology is this one, Mrs. Rochester's Attic, um, which is stories of sort of madness, strange love affairs, dark secrets, doom things. It's a cheerful book. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. Um, I, I had encountered the term slipstream relatively late and wasn't quite sure what it was, but apparently that's what we're doing, and it means fiction that sort of is, crosses over from mainstream into, into genre. So, I, and, I, and I found, ah, oh, that's what I've been reading all these years and liking. <laughs> and uh, and that, I think that's what we're aiming to publish a lot of the time as well. Um, so, we're doing the small books still. We've got another two coming out. Sarah Leavesley has written a companion piece to Kaleidoscope. So, the, the main character in Kaleidoscope's sister um, has a sort of parallel experience. So, there's going to be two books that sort of work together. Um, and we've got another novella coming out at the same time. And we've got a third anthology called It Came From Beneath the Waves, which is a sort of 50s, um, <laughs> 50s pulp kind of thing, but actually is just really strange, slightly weird tales of, with, a, with a sea theme. Um, so it's quite specific, but actually we've had some really interesting submissions. We had a very small number of submissions. One of these we had 140, which took some planning through. This has had a much smaller number, but they seem to be of a higher quality, which is interesting. So we're just looking at that. That has actually closed, but again, if anybody's got a C story in their bottom drawer and think, oh, I wish I'd known about that. I could have got rid of this story about, you know, it takes place on a cross-channel ferry or something, whatever it might be. I'd be quite happy to have a, a few more in from people if they want to do that. Um, we've taken a lot, it's been a really 
interesting learning curve doing this actually um, and we've learned a lot of things that we tried and didn't know like how do you market these things how do you sell them how do you distribute them that's been quite sort of difficult finding out about but it's been interesting and one of the pieces of advice that we got from Five Leaves Bookshop was it's a lot easier not to publish fiction <laughs> which was sort of helpful but actually the point they were making was if you write a book about um, 17th century fencing um, then it doesn't really matter who's written it if you, you'll find the audience of people who are interested in that um, having said that you know we're still very committed to fiction because it's what I particularly love but we've also started going back to Mantle's roots in a way and doing um, 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 historical books. So we've just done a project based around Wordsworth, who lived in Leicestershire in 1807, down the road from where we are, for a year, um, and designed a garden for Culloden Hall. Um, so we've published a little book about that, which is quite interesting, and goes with a project which was basically an audio drama. So we did a community radio play in effect, um, that's available on CD and the book goes with that. And then in the next year we're doing two more factual historical books, uh, one of which is based on the Colville 50, who were the first 50 people who volunteered for the First World War. Um, and that's been, we're working with um, the people who've run that in the Colville Times, because it's been like a, a, a person out of the 50 every day in the Colville Times for a length of time. So that's going to become book which is quite interesting and then we're also doing a, a West Midlands based history which is uh, uh, based around um, Wolverhampton and uh, that is possibly being co-published with the National Trust who are sort of making interesting and encouraging sounds at the moment so that's a, an area that we're developing as well. Um, the other sort of crossover thing that we want to do is we've encountered all these prospective children's writers through Walls and Apples and it seems silly not to publish something that's involving their work. So one of the small books in the next year might be um, something for children, which would be quite a nice link. And we're starting to work with other writers and we're uh, very keen to do so. And Rob G, apart from those two books that we've published of Rob's, we've also done the script of his uh, performance, um, Forget Me Not, which is and an Alzheimer's who done it. So we've published the script of that for him and it has an audio CD in the back. So we're sort of starting to work with local writers on publishing things that they have um, an interest in, in getting out there. And that's been a very positive experience as well. So it's very, very early days really, even though we've, I feel we've done quite a lot now. Um, we're learning how to sell these things. We're learning who might be interested in them. Um, but, um, you know, still feel as though we're at an early stage of all this and just very interested in sort of trying to become part of an ecosystem I think in, in, in the county and the city and that's why this event I thought was very interesting because it's, you know, we, I think you always find that there are groups of people that you just haven't realised are there and you can operate happily doing this sort of thing for years and years and years and never realise that there's another group of people doing exactly the same thing just up the road and sometimes it is literally just up the road and that's happened to, to us quite a lot in terms of arts. You know, you suddenly find there's a sculptor who works sort of five miles away from you and you've been doing sculpture projects for 20 years and you never knew they were there and they didn't know you were there. So I think the one thing that I'm interested in out of this is, is sort of becoming part of the ecosystem of organisations doing writing stuff and having contact with people who are writing in the city and the county and you know maybe looking for partnerships and crossovers and things where we can or just you know help people out a bit you know give them a bit of advice because I'm now starting having people coming to me and saying how do you publish a book and instead of saying I don't know um, you know you actually have some information you can pass on now so uh, so I think it's, yeah, that's it really. We can do. Is everyone happy for us to have a copy of the mailing list that you've already signed? Yeah. 
just to save time. Okay. If, if anyone good. objects, please uh, mark your name yeah, with you, a. If you don't, yeah. not that in some way. <laughs>